Peace, people. In this episode of Real Talk with Tehran Poole and Roxana Irani, we are going to talk about the historical events and some figures in connection to a group known to the Islamic tradition as the Qadijites, an allegedly radical Muslim sect that emerged in the second half of the 7th century and played a significant role in the early Islamic period. The Qadijites were a powerful uh, force in the Islamic world and known for their strict interpretation of Islam and their zeal for social justice. They believed in the Islamic that the Islamic community should be led by a person of piety and that any leader who violated Islamic law, regardless of their status, should be deposed. This uncompromising attitude towards pious governance and justice led the Qadijites to challenge the Umayyads and Abbasid authorities, causing numerous rebellions in the various regions of Arabia, Iraq, Iran, and even as far as North Africa. And to help shed a bit of light on this often overlooked and understudied movement with from early Islam, I am pleased to welcome our current guest, Dr. Hannah Lena Hagman from Hamburg University. Thank you for joining us once again to talk about a group I'm actually quite sympathetic to, towards, even <laughs> with the bad rap that they may have. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, for the for the invitation. I'm looking forward to your, to joining you again. Um, first time was fun, I thought. Yeah, no, it was um, definitely fun. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Unfortunately, <laughs> Adam's not joining us for this one, but uh, maybe on a later yeah. date uh, we we can speak to maybe him in about the future topic. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, yeah, his uh, latest book is actually really good. Um, it's very concise, and I found it to be um, very eye-opening concerning a lot of uh, Muslim sects that I had no knowledge about, but that's besides the point. Uh, so yeah. talking about this Muslim sect, no Muslim group in all of Islamic history has been written about so spitefully and in a more critical manner to the extent that the Kawadaj have. So for those of us who are interested in knowing their history as it happened, we're faced with the reality that the vast majority of the historical data we have for the Kawadajites of the 7th and 8th century have been passed through the hands of people from a later date, unsympathetic to their movement and what they stood, uh, stood for, which calls into question the credibility of much of the information available on them. But nevertheless, I believe that some kind of positive history uh, can be achieved from the data that we have, even though that might just be based on optimism and not on anything um, anything substantial uh, that I know of at the moment. Um, but uh, Dr. Hagman, when I first reached out to you for this po podcast interview on the historical Qadijites, I remember you basically telling me that the sources on them before the second fitna are very much confused, but that after their histor historicity starts to stand on firmer ground. So I'm curious, what's so different about the sources concerning the movement before 692 when compared to what we have written about them thereafter? That That's a, that's a very good question. I think... Um... It's not necessarily just that the sources are confused, um, what, what, whatever that means. Um, a lot of contradictory narratives. A lot of, I mean, I mean, the contradictory part certainly continues <laughs> into later, into later periods. Um, partly the problem is um, that the origin of the Kharajites is so closely tied to the events of the first civil war and to Safin. Um, and of course, you know, we have the, the major figure of Ali uh, in, 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 you know, uh, in, the, in the middle of all of that's going on. Um, and uh, much of the information um, that deals with this, this conflict, with the first fitna, with Safin, with uh, the, the conflict between Ali and other prominent members of the, the early community, and of course, of course also with the um, Kharajites, is so, um, has taken on so much meaning. Um, over time, because Ali has uh, developed into such an important figure um, that the um, the Safin accounts, for instance, um, are very very difficult uh, to deal with. Um, so that's I think that's that's one problem that the origin already um, is so so closely tied to fundamental ideological and political questions and conflicts. Um, the the period after, so um, the 660s, 670s, uh, um, they are less well documented. That's one problem. Um, so compared to uh, the first fitna and then, but then of course also to uh, some of the, the, the periods after, uh, we just have less information. So that's that's one problem. Um, and then also the... Um, the events of the seventh century are they they're, they're really they're so far removed especially in the first first half um from from the time when we actually get the extant written sources um, that especially for events that have a very very high um 
or very, very strong um, political and religious meaning, um, it's very difficult to disentangle um, what, what's what's going on there. Um, the reason why generally the the early history of Islam, um, a lot of people say, is um, sort of easier to grasp, perhaps, um, from the, the period of the second fitna on, um, is because we, uh, for instance, get some material evidence um, mm -hmm. that we don't really have for the period before. Um, coins, inscriptions, um, some archaeology. Um, and it's also basically the, the the further on we go in time, when we when we get into the eighth century and then certainly to the ninth century, much of the evidence actually becomes more contemporary in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is why it's a it's a little bit, and I say a little bit, um, a, a little bit easier, uh, as it were, to get to get a grasp of 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 the of the events, which isn't to say, um, and and I agree into I agree with you entirely, which isn't to say that it's impossible to do any kind of positivistic history. Um, we we do have a lot of data, and I think we'll probably talk about this um, a little later as well. I think a lot of the information that we actually do have hasn't really been 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 used. Um, or hasn't really been been utilized to the extent that that, that it could be. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the um, of of biography and prosopography because we have this incredibly rich genealogical um, tradition and biographical uh, tradition. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of potential there um, for for investigating um, the historical Kharajites, but of course other other groups and other actors uh, as well. Um, I hope that helps um, no, a little bit. No, definitely. That was an excellent answer. And that uh, leads me to my next question about the study group that you're leading that focuses on rebellion in uh, the early Islamic period. Uh, just because we didn't talk about that in the last interview, yeah. I believe, um, if you actually wanted to give some information about the study group that you're leading, because it focuses on um, a lot of what we're going to talk about concerning revolts and stuff like that, because many more happened other than uh, involved oh, yeah. in the Karajites, <laughs> which oh, yeah. for some reason kind of make things um, a little bit more difficult to distinguish between what was yeah. a Kharajite revolt and what wasn't a Kharajite revolt. So uh, yeah, I'll let you give a little bit of promo towards your uh, for your study group. Yeah, I mean, you've already put your finger on on exactly the um, uh, like one of the main points um, that that we're trying to 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 work on that we're trying to investigate. Um, so the the group that I lead is called Social Context of Rebellion in the Early Islamic Period. Um, and as the the title already says, what we're interested in um, is primarily um, socio-political and socio-economic backgrounds to um, a general sort of rebellious milieu. Um, so we're, we're starting in 692 for the reasons I just outlined, um, and we're going until the, the early 9th century, um, round about the time uh, of uh, Al-Ma'mun's sort of consolidation um, after the 4th. Fitna. So we're going basically second fitna to the aftermath of the fourth um, fitna. Um, and so what basically the um, what, what we're doing is there are four of us um, and every one of us uh, investigates a different category or, or group um, of uh, rebellion. And uh, I do the Kharajites to the surprise of absolutely no one. <laughs> um, but we also look at uh, Alits and specifically at Zaydis, um, who have been similarly understudied. Um, and at the Ashraf, so at tribal notables, um, particularly in the east, um, so Iraq um, and, and further east. Um, and then we also have one person who studies so-called non-Muslim uh, revolts with a particular focus on on Armenia. Mm. Um, and the um, the question of how to distinguish um, that you just posed is a very, very good one. Um, and I think we're I mean, we're, we're, the, the group will go on for another three years. So um, we're, we're talking preliminary findings here. But I think what has become clear to us already um, is that there's a lot of overlap between these various different categories or groups um, of rebellion. And I think in particular for, for Kharajites and Ashraf, um, it's very difficult in certain cases to, uh, to really distinguish. Um, the, the question, of course, remains, what, 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 does, what does the label mean? What is a Kharajite revolt? In what sense is it fundamentally and substantially different from the revolt led by someone else, especially when you have a big movement where you have lots of different actors, lots of different players with different motivations. 
Um, for instance, the cluster of revolts um, that we have in the in the 740s, so during the third fitna, and the, the, which sort of like seamlessly moves into the events of the the Hashimi takeover, um, there are uh, a, there, there are so many revolts led by very different people. Mm -hmm. um, some of these are pretty big. Um, probably the most famous one of the two most famous Harajite ones is the Harkavan case who yeah. was based in the jazeera and in, in iraq um and if i mean the numbers are probably exaggerated um because that's usually what happens um but at some point he's said to have had a hundred thousand followers um and um in, it's not just the size but it's also the fact that uh he's he's said to have led a very uh diverse group um with even some of myads joining him um, and so the question then is, in what sense is this a Kharajite revolt? Um, so this is, I mean, we have we have a very long laundry list of questions that we're that we're trying to work on, um, and we're, we're very excited about about the work itself um, because I mean it's it's an exciting topic anyway, but it has the potential to give us so much more insight into um, basically how early Islamic or Islamicate societies worked, really. So these processes of of power negotiation and of conflict negotiation, um, the dynamics um, can really tell us quite a bit about uh, basically the social fabric um, and, and to sort of like get away from this idea of you have a caliph at the top and then you have the caliph's functionaries or officials um, sort of like implementing top down um, uh, decrees and basically sort of pol politics from the top. Um, but we can, I think we're starting to see that there was also quite a bit of politics uh, from, from the bottom uh, going on. Um, so one of our working premises, um, and this is something we're, we're, we're hoping to substantiate over the next few years, is that rebellion wasn't necessarily a, a disruption, um, but it was a part of the system. So a way of, of negotiating, a way of trying to get access to resources or status um, or um, even just to get, you know, uh, uh, how do you say this in English? Like a, a leg over your uh, uh, your your rivals? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's very interesting. I never thought about it like that. That um, rebellion or revolts in this time was a way of negotiating politics or negotiating terms. Um, I always thought of it as like just wanton uh, destruction mm -hmm. and no no um, no objective. But of course, there's an objective behind it. But it just seems to be more uh, willy nilly than anything organized. But the way that you described it uh, definitely kind to change my mind about it and i'm interested in seeing what uh results you guys turn out me too <laughs> um this this of course this isn't to say that this this goes for every single revolt of course not um but i think there are there are so many um, other institutions as well involved in this whole um uh this whole rebellion thing um intercession played a really important part um the aman the safe conduct um played a really important part in conflict resolution um there was um perhaps something even like a playbook um, where you had an exchange of letters, an exchange of envoys. So it's it's certainly not the kind of uh, wanton violence um, um, that I think a lot of people have in mind when they think of rebellion, um, they think mm -hmm. of, of upheaval, of social strife, which of course it is to an extent, um, but it's it, in many cases it certainly wasn't senseless and, and it certainly wasn't um, wasn't always the first choice or the last choice, it was one choice. Um, but again, this is this is our working premise, our working hypothesis, um, based on some some of the evidence that we've 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 gone through so far. Um, but this is something that, as I said, we're hoping to substantiate over the next few years. Okay, sounds amazing. Uh, and to uh, not move too sideways, because I could ask a lot of questions about the study group. Uh, they also have a Twitter um, for yeah. anybody who's interested. Uh, they're very active, yeah. and they uh, let people know of any uh, Zoom lectures going on involved with the group. So that's an excellent resource for anybody interested. Um, and so looking at the after effects of Nerawan, even though I said that, you know, uh, even though you said yeah. that area is very much confused just so we can do maybe a hit and run on this area to provide some background or just I, I do have a few questions about mm. the after effects of the Battle of Narawan basically um, according to what has been recorded in the sources we don't have to go too deep into it because uh, as I've already mentioned uh, you stated the sources before 692 are a ball of confusion however there are two events from this period I found particularly interesting. Firstly, the Karajite revolts, which happened during the Caliphate of Ali ibn Abi Talib, immediately after the Battle mm -hmm. of Narawan, and the second 
Uh, the second one would be, uh, I, I read this in the Chase Robinson book and Adam Gaser uses this word too, to, to Faruk, to Faruk, the mm -hmm. uh, separation of the quadrage, uh, but okay, so of 683, which uh, gave way to what we know, uh, what is known as the Asul al quadrage. Okay, so the sources record that a number of Mohakama who had survived the battle at Narawan migrated to various regions across the uh, abode of Islam. According to al Sharistani, two had gone to Oman, two had gone to Kirman, two to Sistan, two went to the Jazeera, two to Tal Mazan, and two others to Yemen. So in your view, from your research, does what Shahrastani report seem plausible in explaining how Qadijism spread to the regions just mentioned? And would it be too far-fetched to suspect that more survivors than uh, more people survived than 11 from the battle, or that maybe not all of those who succeeded from the army of Ali at Safin fought against him at Narawan? Uh, because, um, yeah, that's my question. Sorry, I didn't want to uh, say too much. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that is a very big question. Um, it, it, and I guess to an extent, it comes down to your your epistemological framework um, and how you basically how you approach the sources. Um, Shah Rastani is a very, very interesting um, character and a very interesting source. So he's a 12th century um, heavisiographer. Um, as you could probably, I mean, you could probably see me smiling during the enumeration of who and where. Um, it's a very nice, neat division of people um, that fits really nicely. Um, personally, I would be skeptical um, also because um, sometimes we get information in these later sources that we don't find in the early sources, which makes it even more difficult to, to try and work out where, where this information comes from. Um, sometimes these later works provide information and, 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 and preserve information um, that was lost earlier on. Um, so we don't have the earlier works. Um, but very often, <clears throat> sorry, very often it's it's actually very difficult uh, to try and track where the information comes from. Um, personally, I would be skeptical about this very neat division um, of who went where. Um, it is, of course, entirely possible that um, more people survived Nahrawan. It is so very difficult to tell uh, because Nahrawan is also one of the events um, that has taken on quite, quite a bit of meaning because, again, it involved Ali. Um, Basically, the figure of Ali and his conduct at Sifin and, and Nahrawan, also in the 9th and 10th century, became really important for the development of the law of rebellion, but also the law of warfare. So how do you how do you behave? Do you do you attack without letting your, your enemy know? Do you have to notify them of your intentions? Is there um, basically a step before um, armed confrontation? Do you have to call them to obedience? Um, and so on and so forth. Um, so all of these questions... Um, that were obviously very important um, were, um, or many of them at least, were solved using the historical precedence of Ali, um, which again makes makes it even more difficult to try and disentangle the um, basically the depiction in later sources of how these conflicts should have looked, because by then we actually have a developed law of rebellion and law of of, of warfare. Um, and to what it actually might have looked on the ground. So that this just as a you know as a disclaimer, um, <clears throat> I think it's entirely possible that that more people uh, survived Nahrawan. Absolutely, we do occasionally get mention of of, of people um, who um, who were apparently at Nahrawan and fought against Ali and survived. Um, Abu Bilal, for instance, is a very interesting figure. Um, Abu Bilal Mirdas ibn Odeya. Um, so um, when we get to the reports of his revolt. Uh, around 680, um, then we 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 read that he was one of the people who survived Nahrawan. But when you read the Nahrawan accounts, he doesn't turn up. Really? Um, exactly. So, um, which which of course doesn't have to mean anything. He could well have been among the survivors, you know, who aren't mentioned. Um, but it's um, sometimes it can be a bit difficult to reconcile this this sort of information. Um, so very often we just have to say, well, um, I think this is perhaps the most plausible um, reconstruction or the most plausible version. 
Um, but it's, it's I mean, I, I think there are very few things from this very early period where we can say, right, um, this is this is probably what happened with a with a reasonable degree of, of certainty. So no, I I personally I don't think that we have this this nice and neat division um, of survivors uh, basically going off in pairs and in, into di different directions. Um, I think what is more likely is something um, that, for instance, might explain why someone like Qatari, so a much later um, Kharijite, um, one of the the main figures of uh, one of one of the usul al Khawarij that you mentioned, so a leader of the Azarika, um, um, so he and his group went to Sistan um, after they had to leave uh, Iraq. Um, and it's, I, th I think it's more likely that what happened is because Qatari was involved in the conquest of Sistan, at least according to some, some of, some of what we read about him in the sources, um, that he may have had contacts and connections there already pre-established. Um, so I think to me, something like this, um, is more likely that this actually explains why we have Kharajites in Sistan later on. It's because someone who was a Kharajite, whatever that meant at the time, um, perhaps already had connections there and um and and could go there to uh, basically escape from um from iraq and you know sistan has uh, sorry i didn't mean were you going to no 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 go ahead i was just going to add that you know sistan having uh, read all uh, a good a good amount of the material for this interview um on the cottageites uh, sistan has become a region of of great interest especially the work that is heavily cited in uh, one publication that i read uh the tariq is Sistani, which mm -hmm. I understand kind of, um, I don't want to say paints the Karajites in a favorable light, but they're not as polemical against them from what I understand. Uh, Roxana is the one who brought mm -hmm. it to my attention, so uh, maybe she knows a little bit more about that book than I do, but the gist of it that I get is that it, it seems to kind of paint the Karajites a little bit differently than what you might find in other sources, so I would be interested to find that book and see what, what it's all about. Definitely. Uh, I would say actually that it does depict them in a favorable way uh, and in, in a favorable light. Um, so the Tariq Sistan is available in an English translation, which is a little, it's a little old um, and probably not. I think maybe 200 years old from the one. The, the, the translation, no, the, the translation isn't, the translation is, I think, well, it's 20th century. Um, I've, I've, I can't recall off the top of my head um, when it was published. It's a little bit older, so you know some some of the language um, and perhaps some of the the translation conventions as well um, may not be necessarily what um, you know may not necessarily conform with you know modern standards. But it's a very good way into uh, into the work, um, especially if you if you just want to get a general sense of what's going on and not not use it for. Uh, for academic purposes, for instance, um, although of course it is used, um, and I use it in translation um, uh, as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Tariqi Sistan is is very interesting because it does depict at least uh, some of the Kharajites that turn up in the work, and and they they do turn up a lot, um, basically as 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 fighters against uh, oppression and injustice, um, which often means. Um, uh, what is considered an unjust taxation regime. <laughs> not not much has changed, I would say, over the years. Right. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it's it's a lot more positive towards the Kharajites, especially and especially because it's it's a local history. So it talks about local actors, and it's a lot more favorable towards those local actors um, than much of what we read in the more um, universal or the more comprehensive um, chronicles, for instance. And um, sorry, Roxanne, did you want to add anything to that? I didn't want to leave anyone out from the. Um, well, I just wanted to ask. So obviously, you you mentioned that Tariqa Sistan tends to be slightly more favorable uh, in comparison to other historians. Um, I noted sort of in your book about the Hawaraj, you talked about depictions of the Hawaraj uprisings and how. Uh, under the Umayyads in particular, and how they were written by Abbasid historians like Atabari and Baruthiri, and and whether these depictions were sort of coloured by the needs of the Muslims, who obviously both produced mm -hmm. and consumed this literature, um, and the fact that the nature of these depictions did even di differ between individual historians, um, uh, based on sort of personal political um, 
interpretations basically um, and I wondered if you could explain a little bit about that and specifically why those individual historians differed in their depictions. I, I mean that is also a very big question. Um, um, right, um, I, I do think it has to do with different agendas in part. Um, I think it has to do with differences in where people write and for whom they write um, and why they write. Um, and this, a lot of this is, is really quite difficult to reconstruct. Um, but you have someone like Al-Baladri, for instance, who, um, who was a translator of poetry, he wore, who was an adib, um, who was also a boon companion of two Abbasid caliphs, who was working at the court, um, who was a secretary as well, or at least you know placed somewhere um, in, in the administration of the Abbasid court. Um, he writes about them differently. And the nature of his work, the Ansab al-Ashraf, um, is, is different from, let's say, the tariq of, of Atabari, for instance. Atabari, a, um, an independent scholar um, who, because his family um, had, had quite a lot of money, um, was able to basically focus on his studies um, and do a lot of very serious scholarship um, without, for instance, um, having to uh, find a, a patron at the court. Um, and Tabari, I mean, I guess today his 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 history is um, most famous, or at least what what people usually associate with him. But in in his time and for some time after his death, um, he was actually most most renowned for his um, uh, legal scholarship. So he was a, um, a a legal scholar who, for some time, also had his own um, legal school school. Um, and his his tafsir, so his exegesis of the Quran, was uh, for for quite some time actually more uh, more known or um, uh, more famous than than his tariq. Um, but this this is these I mean these are very different figures. Um, then you have the work of someone like Yakubi, about whom we know almost nothing, who seems to have had some kind of pro alit or Shi'i sympathies or tendencies but we, we really don't know much about him at all uh, most of what we what we know is has sort of been taken from taken from his work uh, so we're trying to understand the author through his work and that's of course a very tricky thing to do um but this this seems to be someone who might have worked for the Abbasids in the administration somewhere, but not at the center. He may have been in Armenia for a time, um, may have lived in Egypt for a time, um, may have tried to basically compile a, a relatively concise um, chronicle, um, universal chronicle, so starting with creation. Um, it's a very different work. Um, it's a synthesis um, in the sense that it doesn't use... Um, individual akhbar with with an isnat so it's hard as well to trace where his information comes from um so you know you have someone like dinawari who was very invested in in presenting the history of um of iran of the iranian people um iranian history as such and again who has a diff different lens i know this is this is a, a very long answer um <laughs> but i think there's there's the, i think these differences in background and interest and intention um explain qu quite a bit and then of course these were also um individuals um with their own um ideas um and then of course it also depends on uh, basically it, it depends on who the Kharajites opponents are. I think that's my reading, of course, um, which, you know, which isn't law, obviously. Um, my reading is that, for instance, when the Kharajites are pre presented as opposed to the Umayyads, they sometimes <clears throat> come off better than when they are opposed to someone like, say, Ali, um, or in some works, even, even Alits or, or Shi'is. Um, so that um, ba basically it's not just about how the <clears throat> how the Kharajites are, are considered or presented. It's also about how their opponents um, are viewed in the tradition. Um, I don't know if that if that helps. I know this was a very general um, sort of response, um, but mm -hmm. it's a it's it's a very big question. It's it's a good question, but it's a very big question. Uh, no, no, for me. it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 absolutely. I felt that that was uh, a really good response, a really interesting response, particularly in in terms of how their opponents um, varied the depictions. Um, 
uh, and how sort of uh, when it's against a significant figure like Imam Ali, it becomes uh, much more weighted with meaning. Um, uh, and when it when it is when the opponents are the Umayyads, the meaning sort of can can be reinterpreted slightly in terms of those rebellions. I find that really interesting. Thank you. Okay, yeah, that was a really good answer. I was satisfied with it. And, you know, one uh, just to uh, go slightly back to the revolts, I mean, one of the reasons why I asked you about uh, were there more survivors or more, um, uh, uh, there was sympathizers, uh, for one, in your um, article, you mentioned that uh, there are Sorry, uh, in your article, you mentioned that after Narawan, it set off um, a number of uprisings against Ali in Iraq by the survivors. So that's what got me thinking, OK, well, there was more than 11 uh, survivors. Uh, and obviously, there were more sympathizers because after Narawan, um, a large number of people revolted 200 at a time during Ali, from what the sources record. And then in the time of Muawiyah, they the uh, rebellions or the revolts tend to double or double in number, which is an interesting point. Um, and so I'm curious about those Qadrajites who chose not to fight Ali at Narawan or to conduct revolts against him thereafter, uh, but decided to pick up arms against Muawiyah um, when he assumed the title of Caliph. I know uh, the simplistic answer would be to say because he was un an un unjust tyrant, but are there any insights into what other motivations and grievances may have been had by the Qadrajites who chose to revolt during the Caliphate of Muawiyah but chose not to during uh, mm -hmm. the Caliphate of Ali? Um, a number of the men uh, who participate, as I mentioned, are uh, double in size, which is um, inter very, uh, I find to be interesting anyway. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to say because yes, the much of what we are told about them is they had been in doubt about fighting Ali, um, but they had absolutely no doubt about fighting Muawiyah and the Umayyads. It's hard to say. Um, I mean, we're um, we're we're basically in 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 the east. So um, the Umayyads, of course, were based in Syria, and we don't really have Syrian Kharijites. So a lot of what what is going on is happening, especially in this very very early period. Um, is happening in Iraq, um, and it's happening um, to a slightly lesser extent in Arabia, um, and sort of like already moving somewhat further east um, into into Iran. Um, so we 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 don't really have direct confrontations with Muawiyah or with the Umayyads. Um, we have confrontation with the Umayyad governors or representatives in yeah. Iraq um, and of the east. Um, so. It's it's hard to, it's 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 hard to say really, um, especially because often for these very early figures, so the Kharijites in during the Caliphate of of Muawiyah, um, there are one or two larger figures about whom we know a little bit more, but very often we only get two or three lines in the sources. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what what is needed, and this this is a huge huge undertaking, um, and it requires certainly more people than are currently uh, engaged in the field of Kharijites and studies. Um, for instance, to do a proper full-on survey um, of the individuals and try and find out what we can about them, for instance, from the biographical dictionaries um, and to see the basic cross-reference, see where else they turn up. Um, I Personally, I think that the geographical distribution, um, which more or less continues, um, so we have Kharijism, and I specifically ex exclude Ibadism here, um, Kharijism seems to be an Eastern phenomenon. Um, the geographical distribution and I think also tribal composition, um, I think are one way forward, perhaps, um, into learning what, what it was all about, um, to the extent that the sources were letters, because of course, of course, the questions or many of the questions that we ask today aren't necessarily the questions that people at the time were interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's also a question of how far can we push the sources and how far do we have to adjust our own, uh, thinking. Um, and, and our own approaches to the material. Um, so it's it's difficult to say. Um, personally, I think the the focus on, especially in this very early period, um, on on the Iraqi milieu, um, I think um, is is a fruitful way forward. Um, but there's still a lot of there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, uh, a lot of information that needs to be sifted. Um, and and as you know, I'm a little I'm I'm more skeptical about how much we can actually push this um, for the period before the very end of the seventh century than I am for the period 
uh, after, which which may sound like a bit of a cop out. Um, <laughs> But it's also it's as I said it's a huge undertaking. Um, we just we just need so many more people who who work on this. Um, the same with the um, the usul that you asked about earlier. Um, so this this uh, I guess you're referring to uh, the narrative of the um, uh, of the division of the split into four four Kharajat mother sets basically. Yes. Um, I mean people have noted uh, and have noticed. Um, that again, we have a very nice, neat narrative uh, here, uh, this division at the same time, in the same place, um, into four different groups. And these are the four groups that will that then persist over time as the main um, sort of mother sects. Um, and uh, I mean, other people have had quite a bit to say about um, Ibadism, so I don't want to uh, repeat it here. But um, I would say that in the same way as the the narrative about how Kharajism spread, they have two people going here and two people going there. Um, I would say personally, again, this is my reading, um, this is um, a very nice systematized um, retrospective um, anchoring in time and place of how Kharajite sets developed um, that personally I would be very skeptical about. If you don't mind, if I just add something to that, uh, going back to Al Sharistani's um, description of how mm. Karajism distributed throughout the Islamic world, he seems to side. One thing I noticed, he seems to sidestep that Kufin Basra milieu where Karajism seems to develop. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just curious. Uh, um, Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm stumbling real quick, uh, and I guess because my question, you kind of already went into the uh, Asul al Kawadij narrative, um, and you kind of went over what the problems are. Uh, but I understand that there are different versions of it that appear, uh, with some versions excluding the Abadis and the Sufis yeah. and the lack of clarity surrounding uh, the founding figures of the Sufis and whether or not he existed. Uh, uh, to be honest, every single one in that Usul al Kawadij, you can spend a whole podcast talking about the Abadis, yes. the Sufis, Najda, and the Azrakites. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, Roxana had done a little bit more reading about the Usul al Kawadij than I have. So maybe she can kind of uh, talk about what she was able to find out, especially about the Sufris, uh, because I actually learned a whole lot um, about them for this podcast that I had no idea about. Um, Roxanne, if you just wanted to kind of share uh, your discoveries. Sure. So as as uh, uh, Taryn just mentioned, sort of there's a, a huge lack of clarity around the Sufris in particular, in particular their founding figure. Um, the founding figure seems to vary depending depending mm -hmm. on the historian. Um, and I've heard some scholars like Lewinstein has sort of posited that the Sufri label was back projected by historiographers to sort of accommodate quietist Hawaraj groups who could not be sort of readily classified as Ibadi. Um, so it was essentially sort of almost a sort of catch-all miscellaneous category mm -hmm. for quietists. Uh, and I wanted to ask if you agree with that theory uh, at all. I think Lewinstein makes a good case. Um, I, the the Sufri label certainly seems to be uh, difficult to get a handle on. Um, you have very, very different people and groups um, who are sort of lumped in that category. So it does seem to be a bit of a, a, a hold all uh, container. Um, Kind of like a, like a label for people that you don't really know what else to do with. Um, <laughs> the quietest label is interesting because, of course, we get a lot of people, um, like for instance, the the Kharajai rebels um, in the Jazeera in the six nineties, um, who are also labelled Sufri, and they are certainly not quietest. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's um, it's really difficult to say. I mean, as you as you know, I'm I'm skeptical regarding the whole you know, um, Tafaruk narrative anyway. Um, and as you as you very correctly say, there's a lot of confusion over who is actually involved. So sometimes one of the groups is swapped out for the Bayhasiya, for instance, um, different form, different founders are are, are named. Um, I think I think Lewinstein for the, the Sufriya has, I mean, he, he has me convinced. Um, um, I, th I think he, um, personally, I think he made a good case um, for suggesting that the Sufri is at least at this early stage and in the East, um, 
they weren't, weren't really a coherent group. They weren't really a coherent faction with um, recognizable um, ideas. It's a little bit different um, later on um, in the 8th and 9th century um, in North Africa, for instance, because there we do seem to have um, both Ibadis and Sufris um, and, and actually recognizable groups of Sufris. Interestingly, here as well, um, this is something that I think Wilkinson uh, talked about, Ibadis and Sufris seem to have... Um, recruited from different North African tribes. Um, so we have a, uh, a distinction here as well, not just on whatever the ideological grounds may have been, um, but also on, on actual concrete tribal grounds. Mm. Um, and that is also something we see um, in, in the East. So the, uh, the Ibadis mostly recruited from Southern tribes, Southern Arab tribes, whereas Kharajites we usually find uh, among Northern Arab tribes. Um, so um, this is this is one of the avenues that I mentioned earlier, where I think a lot of very, very fruitful work can be done, um, just taking a much closer look um, at the at, at the, tr the tribal and or ethnic familial and so on um, backgrounds of these revolts to the extent that the sources uh, letters, but often they let us to to, to a surprising uh, extent. Yeah, I was actually surprised by the tribal composition of uh, the Karajites after the so-called Tafaruk, um, where Danu Hanifa uh, kind of mm -hmm. raises uh, to, to, yeah. to the occasion and yeah. takes over leadership of a good part of. Um, and Danu Hanifa, from what I understand, were uh, huge supporters of Musaylima. And because they were supporters of Musaylima, they were excluded from many of the events that mm -hmm. happened in the Islamic world thereafter. And then, uh, which excluded them from even, from what I understand, Narawan and maybe some of those events. And then they joined Qadijism afterwards. And it wasn't until reading your article, Umayyad, um, Qadijism in the Umayyad period, and you have a really nice chart of the tribal composition that when I was doing a bit of investigation mm -hmm. um, or reading, and it came mm -hmm. to the uh, article by Montgomery Watt, where he mm -hmm. also has their tribal affiliation. I was starting yeah. to notice a pattern, especially when it came to uh, maybe a, a, a larger tribe that mm -hmm. the smaller tribes came from, such as Mudar. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and also it just made a lot of sense when they moved into Iran and the problems that they had uh, maybe with the local inhabitants and uh, them accepting them, uh, but not to move too sideways from, and. Uh, and I'll just leave it right there because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to take up too much time talking about this. And I will recommend for the audience to go read and I'll have a, a Qadijite reading list put together. Uh, Very good. Yeah, because um, a lot of this information is thralled across a lot of different sources. Um, yeah. A lot of people have written about them, um, not in the detail that you're writing about them, but they but you'll find papers from such people, Montgomery Watts. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. By Chase yep. Robinson. Uh, same thing with Maroney. He has a chapter on the cottages of in Iraq. Yep. So yep. Uh, I'll leave a reading list so people can do further investigation. Uh, but now we're moving on to firmer ground, Cottagism in Upper Mesopotamia, also known as the Jazeera. Uh, Chase yes. Robinson, in his book, uh, chapter five of his book on Cottagism, mentions that the local tradition of Cottagism in the Jazeera starts with a figure named Sali ibn al-Masari, who raised a revolt in mm -hmm. 695. Uh, this guy is a very difficult figure to find information about. I didn't find anything on him in the Encyclopedia of, of uh, Islam. I didn't see, or unless I'm incorrect and I just wasn't, uh, I didn't know how to look for him in the Encyclopedia, but I couldn't find anything on him. And uh, he doesn't have a Wikipedia page. Um, maybe you might find things about him in, a, in other sources, but do we have an origin story for, for Sali ibn al-Masari? Saleh, yeah. Um, Saleh is a very interesting figure. So Tabari has a little bit on him um, and, and some of the other sources as well. So we know him mainly as um, a very pious figure. So um, as an ascetic, um, a Quran reciter, um, uh, someone who had um, a lot of religious knowledge. Um, and this, this is, I mean, it's, it's kind of the prototype of the Kharajite figure um, as, as we encounter it, um, at least some of the more prominent ones. Um, there may have been, I mean, he's he's certainly the main figure that sort of starts off uh, the main chapter of Kharijism in the in the Jazeera. There may have been others before him, um, but again, um, none of this work has actually properly been done. So it's um, as I said, it's a very long laundry list of things to do um, for our group. Um, but he's certainly the main figure, um, and. Um, 
yes, he had a reputation for for piety, for for religious knowledge, um, uh, for you know, as, as a scholar, basically. Um, it's for these figures. It's often very difficult to try and work out why they decided to take up arms, so, because usually it's explained with um, resistance to uh, oppression and tyranny um, and injustice. Um, whether that stands and what what is actually meant by that um, is is something that I think uh, we need to devote more uh, more attention to, um, because there there are other such figures who are. Um, associated with him. So the next big one is Shabib, Shabib Ibn Yazid, um, who may have joined him, um, who may have been a part of Saleh's group and to, then took over after Saleh was killed, but who may also have had just an entirely separate um, revolt. Uh, the sources uh, aren't very clear on that, um, or rather we get different, different presentations. Um, but we also have a very interesting account in the source that um, I think still not enough people are actually take into account, and that's uh, Ibn Atham and Kufi. Um, and Ibn Atham has a very interesting account of um, Shabib and actually um, another uh, similar figure, um, basically going to going to Abdul Malik in in Damascus um, uh, and basically trying to get concessions from him, um, mm. and you know trying trying to get concessions for the Iraqi tribesmen, um, but. Um, He's not. Uh, he's not heard, essentially, um, and so he says, "Well, you know, you'll see. You'll <laughs> see. Uh, you know what the consequences are." Uh, basically, threatens him, um, and then goes back um, to the Jazeera and starts his revolt. Um, this isn't to say that we should, you know, automatically, you know, prioritize uh, an explanation like this, which perhaps sounds a little bit more plausible or seems to get more, seems to give more of the background story. Um, but it's certainly worth worth investigating because um, there's at least one other such figure um, who then who basically went went to Abdul Malik um, to try and get uh, concessions um, for him and for his for his people um, was refused and then went back and turned Kharajite. Um So it's uh, I feel like I say it's difficult all the time, um, but it really is, especially because again, a lot of the background work hasn't hasn't really been done yet, or hasn't been done to the to the uh, extent that that it is necessary. Um, so Saleh seems to have been um, this this very pious um, figure um, who, according to most sources, I would say, um, took up arms because he opposed. Uh, the injustice of the Umayyads. Um, so he wasn't a soldier, because um, that, that was he, something me and Roxana were trying to yeah. uh, figure out. Was he a soldier? Was he a soldier? And not that I know of, which of course doesn't doesn't mean that he wasn't. Um, <laughs> I um, I just uh, may not have you know come across that that information. Certainly Shabib was, and that is a very interesting thing that uh, Robinson also points out that we have figures like Shabib and there are others. Um, who were part of the caliphal armies and were then dropped from the Diwan. And some of these either uh, turn bandit or turn Kharajite. And then some would say there isn't really much difference between the <laughs> two. <laughs> but um, yeah, because... because it's certainly a pattern and, it's, and it's, it's a very common pattern. It's not something that is restricted to, to the early Islamic context of the seventh century or something. It's something, for instance, we also see um, in, in, in a Roman context. So uh, soldiers who... Um, you know, for instance, after the end of a war, um, were basically dropped uh, from that version of the Diwan. Um, a lot of them um, were were out of the way of, of of making a living, and so a lot of a lot of the bandits we read about in the Roman countryside, for instance, um, Roman as in the entire Roman Empire, not just Italy. Um, uh, a, lo a lot of them were former soldiers who had to make uh, their living a different way. So it's it's you know it's um it's it's a very common phenomenon. So it it wouldn't be it wouldn't be strange. Um, to to see to see a process like this. Oh, I definitely agree because the one thing that I uh, uh, reading uh, the chapter by Chase Robinson, which really popped up in my mind, uh, especially when he equated Sali ibn al Masari and Shabib ibn, ibn Yazid to a uh, Hobbes Bamian uh, bandit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Robin Hood popped up in my mind. Robin yeah. Hood, Zorro, yeah. a whole list of yeah. figures who yeah. um, I saw a lot of similarities. Yeah. So 
my question is, um, what are your thoughts of, uh, on seeing Sali, Ibn al-Masari, and Shabib as uh, Hobbes, Bamian, or so social bandits within their context? Uh, do, would you agree with that? Or is that just a little bit too romanticized, uh, uh, too romantic, uh, a re overly romanticized view of uh, their revolts and what they stood for? I mean, Hobbesbaum, Hobbesbaum's concept or or or, or, or notion of social banditry um, has received a lot of criticism over the last 50 or so years. Um, I mean, sometimes they are presented in a way that is kind of reminiscent um, of, of the type of um, social bandit um, that Hobbesbaum describes as, so basically hero figures. Um, sometimes in interactions, for instance, with, with local communities, um, and interestingly, um, especially the me communities. Um, so there's, there's one report, which I think Robinson also talks about, of um, uh, basically uh, Shabib being, being welcomed by um, uh, a Christian town um, who open their gates to him and say, we prefer you uh, because you are, you are just and you don't, uh, you know, you don't commit the kind of... Um, uh, tyranny that the Umayyads do, so we prefer you. Um, so, th so that that is kind of reminiscent. Um, it's hard to say what these revolts stood for, um, which makes it which makes it difficult to um, really really speak to that. Um, and of course, there there is very much the difference between um, what was actually happening on the ground and then its its representation. So I think the representation, as I said, sometimes. Um, evokes this, the, the sort of image of a social bandit. Um, whether that is what was going on at the time on the ground is is, is difficult to say. I mean, for someone like Shabib, um, I mean, the, the kind of like, he, he doesn't, he, he strikes you as, as a kind of like bandit hero, like, you know, adventure tale sort of figure. Um, not necessarily a Robin Hood type of figure, you know, like this, um, you know, taking from the rich, giving to the poor sort of thing, you know, looking after local communities. Um, I mean, I guess because Robin Hood was a, a soldier in the uh, part of yeah, the age, yeah. and he became disillusioned by by that. Yeah, sure. Of life and sure. turned to the Sherwood Forest. And um... if, well, yes, um, if the, <laughs> depending on what you make of that story. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, no, but it's, uh, it's it's difficult to say. I mean, like these 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 figures. I mean, we we shouldn't forget also that these 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 figures are not they're not modern they're not modern inventions obviously I mean they've they've existed for a very long time these narrative figures, um, and so it perhaps isn't unusual to see some cast in those roles um, and and to see I mean we you know we need explanatory paradigms so it's it's perhaps not surprising to see certain people in certain events cast you know in according to certain narrative patterns. Um, you know, which which doesn't mean that it's that it's all, you know, you know that it's that it's all, you know, untrue or lies or anything. Um, but it's it's a particular way of of seeing and of presenting um, history. Yeah. Um, so that that's something we always need to we we always need to keep in the back of our minds. And we do the same, of course. Um, but but we need to be aware of the fact that we're all doing it. Um, and you pointed this out in your book uh, under a footnote. I think you were referencing mm -hmm. Najem Hader uh, from yeah. his book. I can't remember exactly, but that um, the way that we understand history today, the way that we write history today is not exactly how history has been written throughout our history. Mm -hmm. We also need to uh, keep that in mind when we look at historical narratives from the past uh, to say that these people were lying or fabricating things might be um, a bit uncharitable. uncharitable to, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, their intentions yeah. behind yeah. what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't think lying or or or, or forging um, is you know is is at all the right way of describing the process. Not at all. Um, what is interesting with Saleh and and uh, Shabib and their followers and the other sort of smaller uprisings um, that then continue in the Jazeera um, is that again you have a very clear tribal um factor um so again um like most of them are uh, banu shaban some of them are yashkur but all of them all of these uh, belong to bakr and wa'il who again are a northern um who are a northern tribal uh group um and it's it's very i mean it's it's very clear so, and you, in the jazeera in particular um the revolts also seem to be sort of like passed down from from generation to generation yeah. so you get you Shabib's get fathers son. and sons uh, yeah. uncles and nephews uh, cousins brothers um who you know as as, as part of the same um, rebel groups or as sort of like passing on um the the legacy 
um, so again, um, it's it, it it's almost kind of like a like like a regional or 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 sort of tribal of or, or, or family tradition of Kharijism, um, which also invites us to ask questions about what this what this means. Um, this this it it. it, it it's it's difficult to say um, what Kharijism might have meant to these people. I mean, what like it it depends on the kind of definition that we apply. So our definition of Kharijism, there are certainly several, um, which and they may not have much to do with what people at the time thought they were doing. Um, so, but I, I mean, personally, to me, um, the fact that we have these very clear patterns um, in uh, tribal composition, geographical distribution, um, family connections, um, also a very, a very, very diverse sort of pool uh, of people who who either turned Kharijite or supported Kharijite revolts, um, suggests that the the kind of simplistic image that you that you sometimes still 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 read and hear about. Um, of them basically being these these super religious, uh, super pious fanatics, you know, excessive in everything they did, um, heretics, and so on and so forth, um, doesn't really fit what we see in the sources. And I think part of that is because scholarship also tends to focus on the really spectacular militant uh, Kharijites. Um, but there are so many varieties of Kharijism, uh, so many different ways in which um, someone could be a Kharijite, um, you know, even temporarily, or support a Kharijite revolt because, you know, it perhaps accorded with um, your your own your own intentions, your own aims, even though you didn't necessarily share uh, much of a doctrinal or ideological basis. Um, and, I, and I think this this I think the variety gets lost sometimes um when we focus only on you know on shabib on the azarika on on nahrawan and so on and so forth um and especially for kharijism in the early abbasid period we know almost nothing i think there are two or three articles perhaps yeah that's um, kind of why i sidestep the abbasid period and just yeah it, or yeah. plan on ending this interview with the end of the yeah. period because yeah. i from what i've been reading kharijism under the abbasid period kind yeah. of I don't want to say takes a turn, but uh, goes in a slightly different direction than what it was before, from what I understand. Or maybe I didn't articulate that right, but uh, it, it's yeah. different in the Abbasid period than it may appear from my understanding. It's that's that's how it's presented. I think we don't really know enough um, to, about Kharijism in either period to say, <laughs> and um, and especially especially for the Abbasid period. And this is this is one of um, one of the things that I want to do as part of this project is to look at early Abbasid era Kharijism. Mm. Um, uh, some of the patterns that we see, so for instance, in the Jazeera, um, certainly the, the tradition of Shaibani uh, and of, of, of family Kharijite revolts continues. Um, in, in other areas as well, um, we, we have a similar sort of interplay between uh, local notables and, and Kharijite revolts that we see in the, uh, certainly in the later Umayyad period. Um, so I think some of these patterns continue. Um, but what we first need to do is actually come up <laughs> with a catalog of criteria um, of what, what makes out these Kharijite revolts. Um, and then I think then we can see and then we can we can assess um, to what extent the nature of Kharijite revolts changes. Um, this is also because we're not actually sure to what extent all of these various different Kharijite revolts were actually connected. I mean, are we talking about a coherent phenomenon? Are we talking about an actual movement? Or are we talking about lots of um, individual or perhaps local or regional phenomena um, that all had their own flavor? Um, and if that is the case, then the, the sort of like grand question of does the nature of Kharijism change from the Umayyad to the Abbasid period? Um, sort of isn't really the right question to ask, um, okay. or at least this, this is. is I mean, these are some of the questions that I grapple with, um, and that I don't really have a great answer to yet. <laughs> okay, uh, but but I think they need to be asked uh, first. Um, and again, like I mean, I can only encourage, I can only encourage people to you know, work on the Kharijites, um, as, and especially, especially to get away from the seventh century um, to the extent that it is possible. Mm. Um, but even even a very interesting group like the Najdiya, for instance, hasn't really been studied properly. Um, I agree. And and I think the, I mean that's it. it the, the name of the group is said to come from the founder Najda. Um, they also conveniently um, settled in Najd, 
in, in the Arabian Peninsula, um, which may or may not mean anything. I mean, in, in, in you know, in the case of Qatari, um, it, you know, despite some other, you know, sometimes modern uh, uh, reconstructions, um, doesn't really seem to have much, have had much to do with the, you know, the modern region of Qatar. Um, yeah, because I was wondering, but, was he from Qatar? What was uh, was Qatari Alpha Ja from Qatar or? Um, I mean, Qatar, of course, at the time, you know, you know, didn't exist. Didn't um, exist. It's uh, um, yeah. So I mean, like it, the connection is sometimes made. I think perhaps based on the um, based on on the name, although sometimes um, his um, his background is given um, at least on one side of the family as uh, Mazini, which uh, is basically the old, um, if I'm not mistaken, Sasanian name for Oman. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like for Eastern, um, for Eastern Africa. Okay, so oh, sorry, for, for, the, for been... Eastern Arabia, of course. So there's a chance um, he could have been of an Omani or what we understand Oman, where we understand Well, Oman. East, Eastern Arabian perhaps. Um, but um, I mean, he's, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, that, that is a question, but for the Najdiya, um, certainly a lot of work uh, needs to be done. They've, they've barely been studied, and especially because sources say they established something of, 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 of a polity in, in Central Arabia um, in the six, 680s and into the 690s. Um, I think that would, that would also be a very fruitful um, project um, to study the history of the Najdiya. So for um, people who are watching, you're giving out a lot of yes, ideas for yes, uh, research yes, projects. You know, so, um... MA papers, PhDs, <laughs> <laughs> so much to do, seriously. Uh, there's, there's so much to do. Um, even just a full survey of all Kharajad revolts, which is something that, that, that we're trying to do in, in the project, but that, that doesn't exist yet. Mm. Um, so the, the article that you mentioned, which I co-wrote with a former colleague, uh, Peter Fekinderen, uh, Kharajism in the Umayyad period, um like we we tried to come like we um we we did a first sort of survey and overview of of Kharajad revolts which is uh, uh included as an appendix to uh the article and it's all open access um so um is it open access well it's open access if you go to my academia yeah, yeah. page <laughs> um <laughs> but um uh yeah so we um uh, we basically that that was the first step in combining a full a full survey or as, as full as least as we can um, and i'm sure we've missed some um but at least it's it's a first step um, but even that hasn't really hasn't really been done um marriage patterns are another very interesting um um that's actually uh, sort of avenue uh that hasn't really been explored roxana might have mentioned something about that that i didn't know that some cottageites even married shia shia figures or uh, i can't remember somebody told me about that which is something i found found very interesting because it demonstrates that maybe sectarian lines weren't as clear or people weren't so people didn't put so much stock into sectarian lines depending on the the nature of the relationship or certain relationships uh because we do see a body figures mm -hmm. who were a famous body figure who was friends with the she uh, oh yeah, yeah. So, um you know it's very interesting when i find things like that in in the literature and the history mm -hmm. uh now to talk about a part or an aspect of Karajite history that is actually fairly new to me. I didn't even, I had no idea that the Karajites spread to Iran. Well, I did because of uh, Nafi uh, Ibn al Azraq went to uh, mm -hmm. Al Ahwaz and was terrorizing people in that region. But I didn't know that the Karajites had a presence in Iran the way that they did uh, until reading uh, in a um, uh, chapter out of a book by uh, Skladenik. I cannot pronounce his mm -hmm. last name. But um, it was very interesting, although he draws a lot from the heresiographical mm. um, literature, he still kind of puts together somewhat of a narrative that you can kind of get the gist of maybe what happened in that region. So um, can you briefly explain how Karajites came to be in Iran um, after Nafi had separated from mm. the, uh, the other Karajite groups and went to slightly into that region, but how maybe it, it spread and the history um, that maybe is drawn from the heresiographical works, but mm. may have some kind of real history if you just look at a, a broader outline mm. of things that transpired in that region. Yeah, I mean, this, the uh, Skladanik, the, the author, I, I assume that's how you pronounce the surname, um, the author that you mentioned, so um, like his two articles on Kharajites in Iran uh, from 1981 and 1985 um, are at least, you know, as far as I know, um, still the only um or at least the, the you know the only main publications that they really try to give 
an outline of, of the groups in the chronology and so on and so forth. Um, so these, um, yeah, I mean, like the first one is over 40 years old. So again, just to give you an idea of what all needs to be done. Um, of course, individual uh, groups um, and, 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 and events have been dealt with in, in lots of other uh, publications, um, but uh, for a kind of general overview, um, we're really still dependent um, on his work. Um, In a way, I think I think there are at least two factors cons to consider. The first is uh, the one that I mentioned um, earlier, which is that people like uh, Qatari, who was a leader of the Azarika after Nafi, um, perhaps had pre-existing relationships, um, for instance, in Sistan, um, and so basically had a place to go, um, had perhaps a community um, that would have supported them, um, or at least connections among the among the local locals. Um, I think the second factor, and this is something that isn't uh, uh, limited to the Kharajites, but is something that we see in general, is that um, rebels often go east, um, and they, they, they rebels rebels go into Iran um, quite a lot uh, from Iraq and from Arabia uh, at least, um, which of course has to do with proximity, but also has to do um, with the environment. And I think this is also a factor that is that is still not acknowledged. Um, sufficiently in, in a lot of scholarship. Um, so uh, the, the impact of, of the environment uh, on people's decisions. So um, Iran, as we know, um, has a lot of, for instance, very mountainous areas. Um, so we find we find rebel groups very often in mountainous areas, not just in Iran, but also um, you know, in, in, in the Jazeera and the Caucasus and so on. Um, or generally not just mountains, but um, hard to access territories so remote territories um because of course you know you go there because um let's say there's less enthusiasm to follow you there um and of course the locals you know 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 the area a lot better um than potential colorful troops um sent after after them um so i think um the the, the kind of the, the Kharajite movement towards the east um also has to do with um trying to evade um sort of government access uh, and, and and trying to evade um in some cases the troops that were sent after them um depending on what we think Kharajism was um it also seems to have resonated um with some locals um with, lo with local communities um so Sistan and Kerman and to a lesser extent Fars um are the areas in Iran that are perhaps most um um sort of associated and, and, and best known for, for the Kharajite communities. Certainly Sistan and Kerman uh, seem to have been hotbeds. Um, but there as well, we don't really get a sense that these groups were all radical outsiders. And I think um, to an extent, this is something we read in Skladanik, but also in others, um, which I'm, I'm not convinced by, uh, because you have figures um, like Hamza, the, 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 the late 8th, early 9th century uh, Sistani Kharujite, um, who probably was a local notable himself. He was probably a Dekhan, um, so uh, a descendant at least of one of the, the old Iranian lords. Mm. Um, he clearly had uh, connections um, to the local notables. Um, he, he made deals and, and alliances uh, with some of the Arab officials uh, in the province as well. Um, he, um, you know, he was, of course, uh, there's this very famous letter exchange between him and Harun al-Rashid, but at a later stage, um, the new, a new uh, caliphal governor actually tried to seek his help against another rebel. Um, so we don't really get a sense of them, you know, being these, these very reclusive, um, you know, sort of radical sects that um, distant themselves uh, from, from everyone else. Uh, mm. But figures like Hamza and his groups, they're very much integrated into, into the, the, the social fabric. Um, we're, we're getting a bit, uh, you know, away from your, your original question. Um, but I think no, no, actually it, you're answering, uh, you're actually very much in line with my, uh, question because that was one of the, the questions I had was how successful, um, were the Karajites with the local Iranian population? Because what I get from, uh, Skladenek is that, um, it was a long process of the local Iranians mm. accepting Karajism. Um, mm. Maybe when they first got there, because of the tribal aspect or the tribal component of the Karajite movement, um, kind of excluded Iranians or made it 
not as desirable mm -hmm. because of what Iranians were going through uh, with the Arab conquest and with the Umayyad, or maybe not with the Umayyads, mm -hmm. but there was a bit of tension which kind of separated the um, Iranians from the Karajites when they first came in. And mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time, which is described or demonstrated through uh, the Karajites breaking into different factions that they were trying to negotiate or figure out how to treat uh, th this population. At least that's how I understood it from Skladdenek. Mm. Uh, whatever language is translated from, um, it kind of needs a bit of updating. So oh, I, had yeah. to it, <laughs> I had to read oh, it yeah. a couple of times in order to yeah. kind of get the gist. So maybe what I'm saying is incorrect because I did tell Roxana um, um, uh, kind of uh, what I thought of the art or what the article was about at first. And then I reread the article and I was like, it's not even about that. So, um, you know, I, it's maybe the way I articulate or maybe the way I asked this question didn't, but you just said that the, uh, they, they were fine. The, the local population of the, of Iran and the Karajites, they kind of, um, got on together. Okay. I mean, we need we need to look at this on a case by case basis for all of this. Um, and, and and there are some cases where we, where we can see this very clearly, other cases where we can't see it at all, or other cases where uh, where we just can't be sure. Um, and again, the the information is very unevenly distributed. So you have a lot of attention sometimes on particular figures or particular groups, um, and then almost no attention at all um, on others. Um, so again, that of course also um, influences the way that we that we assess um sort of larger patterns um i mean for you know even in the late seventh century um so for the the group um that was originally led by qatari um we can already see at least judging from from the names which is a tricky thing to do uh, but we can see that judging from the names um that we definitely already have uh, iranian converts among them um it probably would have been difficult as well. I mean, the Sistan seems to have had, um, again, we know very little about the, 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 the period in between, but Sistan seems to have had a more or less consistent Kharajite presence from the late seventh until at least uh, the mid ninth century, um, which is when the Safarids came in and they uh, basically um, managed to solve the Kharajite problem um, through uh, uh, co-optation and uh, eradication. Um, so a bit of a bit of both. Um, but um, I, I think it would have been very difficult to establish yourself um, for such a long period of time if um, if you didn't, you, you can't basically without um, res responding to local communities in some some sense. Um, and there are, of course, I think one of the one of the things that makes Skladanik's articles a bit difficult to read um, is not just because, because the English isn't great. Um, it's also, um, I think, because he was trying to somehow deal with the, the the contradictory information that we get in the sources and trying to harmonize it. Um, and so you sometimes, so you, you get statements like, um, oh, Qatari was joined by 70,000 Zoroastrians um, who would have been local Iranians. Um, and then you also get statements um, that say basically the Arabs, um, the, the Arab Kharajites um, didn't get along uh, with the local Iranian population. Um, probably both needs to be qualified. Uh, for statements, um, but uh, it it seems it seems to be that um, Kharajite revolts did enjoy at least some of them did enjoy some uh, local support. There was definitely integration with local communities, and then um, this is of course much later. But we do get figures like Hamza, um, who seems to have had um, um, you, know, as, you know who seems to have come from you know like these these local Iranian communities of course by then we're in the late 8th and early 9th century so that the situation is very different to what it was in the in the Umayyad period um, and and again uh, so much research still needs to be done on on, on all of this um, that I don't want to uh, you know say anything definite um, for <laughs> now but um, I, th I think also um, I think Skladanik's articles I mean they're from the they're from the early 80s um, I think some of his some of his outlook perhaps is also already um, a little bit outdated now because, for instance, he makes a lot of the almost natural um, sort of dichotomy between Arabs and Persians or Arabs and Iranians. Um, you know, the kind of you know presenting sometimes presenting Iranian Kharajism as a kind of almost nationalist response to. Um, to to Arab rule, um, and and we scholarship doesn't really 
on the whole, at least, um, doesn't really um, work in these binaries uh, any longer. Um, so I think that may have also colored um, some of the presentations, but that also, uh, again, shows how important it is to actually redo some of the work, or at least to continue this, this work. Um, and then, as you said as well, um, a lot of this information is taken mostly from, from sometimes much later heresiographies. Um, and so, you know, that will also have colored um, the, the, the depiction um, a little bit. Um, yeah, because I, I was curious, um, the Karajites, you know, how much blame can we put on the heresiographers uh, for creating more Karajite sects than what probably existed? Because we know of the Hadith 70 of 70, this Uma will break into 73 sects. Sometimes yeah. I believe the heresiographers are trying to fill a quota by turning uh, the Shabib, Shabib gets his own Karajite sects, the, the Shabibia, Sali get his own Karaj, the Salihia. Um, yeah. Abu Fadak, who was part of Najda, gets his own part of another. Yeah. So um, it, it's very creative how they um, t create. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, creative, quite, quite, quite literally. Um, it's, you know, absolutely. I mean, like many people have written about this. Um, Watts articles, I think, are still so very good. There's Adam's new book, which I, um, uh, 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 you know, recommend uh, people read. Um, and, you know, many others have written on, on this phenomenon. Um, it's it's certainly the case, and th and again, this isn't restricted to Kharijites. Um, like it happens with every other group as well. Um, so um, you know, sometimes rarely, um, I would say rarely, people are entirely made up or sects are entirely made up. Um, often, what we get is um, political disagreements. For instance, are turned into um, different, yeah, into different sects, um, kind of uh, kind of thing. Um, so cert certainly I would be skeptical um, about the actual um, number but of, of Kharujite groups, but also how deeply those, you know, those, those disagreements, you know, actually ran um, and, 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 you know, to what extent they actually mattered. It almost seems, and again, this is my, my impression, my, um, my reading, it almost seems like there's a bit of a disconnect between two different levels. So you have sort of the ideological Kharijites that are described in the heresiographies, um, but also in other types of literature. And then you have the actual rebels themselves. So the people who in the sources are called Kharijites um, and then who, who, who do their thing. Um, <laughs> and and I, I sometimes find it hard to, to reconcile the two. Um, you know, to to take a sect, I don't know, like the Ajarida or the Thaalabiya or you know whoever, um, and say, right, you know, this is what they believed, um, and so we have this person in in the sources, and and he he acted like this, so he must have been part of that group, or he is said to have been a part of this group, so we must understand his actions in in this or that way, which is very simplistic, which is not how people do it, of course. Right. Um, but but um, again, to me, there seems to be almost this kind of a disconnect, um, which of course has to do with my, you know, my own approach and my own understanding of, of this literature and of history in general. Um, but but I'm hoping that the work that we're doing as part of the uh, as part of my my current project, um, that we can, you know, at least nuance or um, um, or that we can that we can nuance uh, some of these um, these these differences, or that we can nuance this 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 picture almost. Okay. Um, and just moving on to the uh, to the next topic, which will be the last topic, um, even though I really did try to keep the abides out of this, but <laughs> in, a way, in a way, you kind of have to involve them to a certain extent. Of course, they're, they're guilty by association. Um, uh, Ibadia uh, or Taliban al Haq in Yemen. Um, this is actually an aspect I don't know as much about. I've read mm. a little bit about him passing. But I will hand the ball over to Roxana because uh, she's more enthusiastic about his, this figure in his movement uh, than maybe I should have been. So, um. Um, yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a very fascinating figure. So um, obviously, uh, he's more popularly known as Talib mm -hmm. al by his supporters, which means a seeker of truth um, and was an incredibly successful um, led an incredibly successful movement in Yemen starting in sort of 745. 
Um, I just wanted to ask you initially, could you just provide some background about him? So whether we know uh, what we know about him and his origins and, and whether we know how he was likely first introduced to Ibadi doctrine? Oh, that is very difficult to say. <laughs> Um, be because again, I mean, he's he's counted as an Ibadi figure, um, but it's we're, we're not clear, sort of like mid eighth century, what what that actually might have meant. Um, uh, and and it's not. Again, we have the same problem of even if these people were proto Ibadis um, or proto Kharijites in other cases, um, is this what motivated them to act? Um, these these are two different two different questions. Um, so he's, but he is at least retrospectively counted as an Ibadi figure, um, and as you say, was very, very successful. Um, Abu Hamza, his his uh, deputy in the in the Hejaz, is another very, very uh, successful, very important figure. Mm -hmm. um, it seems, it seems again um, that at least. Uh, Talib um, al-Haq, but also Abu Hamza, that they sort of came, you know, not from. Uh, you know the kind of like the the oppressed masses <laughs> um but were actually um at least um you know parts of local elites as well um so again um th the question is to what extent are we dealing with religious motivations to what extent are we dealing with um uh, political and economic um interests um and timing i think also plays plays an important role um like basically um all of these 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 very large revolts i mean we're we're in in the same period as that of uh, the harkaban case that i mentioned earlier um all of this is happening in the context of the third fitna and of uh, the the open phase uh, of the hashimi um movement um so leading up to the the hashimi takeover and then eventually abbasid abbasid rule um it is it it seems clear and you know both Wilkinson and Geza have written about this this quite a lot um that there is a connection between South Arabian tribes and and this and South Arabia and Ibadism um that Ibadism seems to have spread um among uh southern Arabs um while Kharijism, uh, as I also mentioned earlier spread among northern Arabs uh, in particular um and so it's it's possible that perhaps we're we're dealing with a kind of uh, a combination of um sort of proto ibadism um local you know southern arabian or southern arab um interests and groups um you know using using the basically make making use of this opportune moment because there was a lot of upheaval anyway and so there was space for discontent and there was there was space for for enacting this um I'm not sure how helpful that is, how, you know, to what extent. No, that, actually... no that, that is, that is very helpful. Actually, just focusing on that last point that you made, yeah. uh, I wanted to ask about the sort of sociopolitical factors in the region of Yemen mm. that enabled Talib al-Haq to gain such a popular following in that region. Obviously, there was some quite strong mm. anti-Umayyad mm. sentiment. Yes. Um, and did he sort of knowingly exploit that in his approach to that particular region? That is hard to say. <clears throat> Sorry, just one sec. That that is difficult to say. Um, um, because so first of all, this this isn't someone I've studied in you know in detail yet. Um, but also again, because it will depend on um, on your view of him. Um, mm -hmm. He certainly will have. Um, I mean, th these were very smart people. Um, and especially those who were also part of, of local elites, for instance, they of course had their own networks, and they of course knew how to make how to make the most out of their their, their networks. Um, so um, I think it would be surprising if he hadn't, um, mm. you know, exploited um, you know anti-Maid sentiment, um, tribal structures, um, uh, sort of socio-economic discontent. Um, there was a lot of discontent generally about um for instance resources um being diverted to syria um you know perhaps also i mean a lot of a lot of uh, is made of a kind of like iraqi syrian rivalry um that may have extended to other parts um of of the empire so certainly he will have um he will have made use of all of this and i think that the fact like many of these these large Kharijite revolts Kharijad revolts, Ibadi revolts um, in, in the 740s, as I said earlier, have a very mixed constituency. Uh, and, I, and I think that also um, shows us that um, 
that perhaps doctrine, whatever that may have been at the time, um, you know, was at least wasn't the only factor, or perhaps wasn't even the main main factor, um, but that it was somehow these revolts were uh, were, were able to uh, address a lot of people's concerns at the same time. So people from very very different background. Um, certainly, uh, political economy will have played a role. Um, so if we um, I mean, there's, if if we believe the speeches that have been uh, transmitted, for instance, in the sources, um, if we believe them to reflect at least in some sense um, what people were actually concerned of uh, concerned about at the time, um, then certainly questions of um, the allocation and distribution of resources, um, who has access to um, to public money, to um, to the fate, um, who you know, who has access to. Um, to status and to positions of power, perhaps, and to to economic benefit, um, uh, especially in in you know a, a, a growing empire, um, you know, with a growing number of Muslims all entitled to um, uh, certain privileges. Um, taxation always you know plays a huge role as well, um, as I said earlier. Um, so um, to me, the most plausible reading is that um, we have. Uh, different and complementary concerns that attracted different but complementary constituencies um, and used in particular used uh, periods of upheaval to make a move essentially there is a reason why um, the, the big clusters of Kharajad revolts for instance we usually find in other revolts as well but we usually find clustered around fitness first second third fourth um, whenever you have uh, periods of political instability and of of, of social upheaval, um, of military engagement elsewhere. Um, that's when people um, realize that they have the space to act. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Again, this 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 isn't exactly this this isn't specific to Harajites. Again, I think mm -hmm. one one of the things that we're hoping to do in the project is to also work against this notion of Harajite exceptionalism that we're somehow dealing with something that is that is that is separate that is almost almost so generous almost something that that you don't find elsewhere um that this is like a a a, a special um phenomenon um personally i really don't think it is um i mean i like I, to think that the cottageites are special i mean because just for my own biases <laughs> but that's just me <laughs> Specials. I mean, in, in a way, they're all special in the sense that they're all individual. Um, but I think some of some of the larger patterns are very much the same. Um, so you know, timing, constituency. That that is again, that is another thing that we're that we're investigating as part of the group. Uh, constituencies of 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 revolt. So focusing not just on rebel leaders, um, but also on the people um, who joined, uh, because sometimes I think that can tell us more about what was at stake. Than focusing on these figures who have often taken on um, a lot of meaning um, or who are used to, um, you know, to argue for or against something. Um, certainly, the um, the, the pro alid and and pro Shi'i revolts are another very good uh, case in point here, where um, the, the figures, because most of them are alids, um, you know, have a lot of meaning certainly in 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 Shi'i tradition, um, and so. Um, you know, you know, have, you know, special and sometimes even, even, you know, almost divine characteristics. Um, and so it, it would, I think it's, it's easier to learn something about, in, in, um, easier uh, in a way to learn something about uh, a revolt focusing not on these, these exposed figures, uh, but uh, to the extent that it is possible, actually look at the people um, who joined. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that actually um, helps me with my follow-on question in the sense that he and his followers, Tali Baha, conquered yeah. such a large region, yeah. despite being seemingly sort of severely outnumbered militarily um, by Umayyad forces. I mean, you mentioned Abu Hamza, who was one of his key supporters and almost yeah. like a general type figure under yeah. him, who reached as far as Mecca and Medina and yeah. even Basra for a while swore allegiance to him. So you mentioned, I mean, does, does this constituency that you're talking about help us to understand why his movement became sort of so inordinately successful? I think so. I think it can be one one key to to to, to the answer. I think so, um, because clearly these, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, it's, there's so much going on, uh, but clearly some of these these figures and some of these groups um, managed to make themselves attractive uh, to to very different people. 
um and and certainly and again and again and I know I keep coming back to De Haak um, but that's because he's he's such an interesting figure and his his revolt is such an interesting case um where you even have Umayyad officials and and an Umayyad prince uh, swearing allegiance to him um probably not because they agreed 100% with whatever his um his his religious or 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 ideological um ideas may have been um, but because it was uh, because it was convenient and because they thought um, that by joining him, they could achieve their own um, their own their own aims. Um, similarly, we have uh, so when when this revolt eventually failed, so the Haq was 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 killed in battle. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of successes, um, but um, many of the um, Many of the survivors then joined a um, a Talibid revolt um, led by Ibn Muawiyah. Um, so Ibn Muawiyah himself also a very uh, very interesting figure um, who had among his followers um, Kharijites, you know, proto Shi'is, pro Alits, mm -hmm. um, some Abbasids as well. Um, you know, some people of you know you know entirely different affiliation. Um, and so, um, Taryn, what you mentioned earlier about like, sectarian lines, for instance, not being quite as uh, um, as firm um, as as they may appear today, even though even today they're not particularly firm, uh, depending on context. Um, in the early period, of um, you know, we're, we're basically dealing with a state of of, of fluidity uh, very often, um, not in the sense that it was all you know um, you know basically everything up for grabs and you know um one day you were this and the other day you were that but um there was a lot of connection a lot of intermingling um and and, and i think we need to get away from this idea a little bit that your religious identity is is the main point of identity and that it is the main factor that causes you to act and to act in a certain way um, people's identities were just as complicated and complex as they are today um, and there's very rarely is there one thing in particular um, that causes someone to to act definitely um, one thing that i always like to tell or say is that uh people are more than what they claim to believe in we're way more complicated than that in our um absolutely on life and the way we go about things it's easy absolutely. to claim about what you're attached to whatever group or sets of beliefs you yeah. how you go about that uh is a very different story sometimes Most absolutely time. absolutely um and so i think sometimes that can obscure uh our our perception i guess uh, of of groups and of, of individuals um if you think that someone someone acts because he is a kharajite or she um i think mm -hmm. kharajite women is another very very interesting topic that i hope to explore um later um but if you say he or she acts uh because he or she is a kharajite there's a wealth of connotations and associations um, that that basically say, ah, okay, I understand why he or she acted. When in fact, no, perhaps you did. You you don't actually understand why he or she acted. Mm. And it's it's the same with everyone else. Um, I think for for Shi'is and Kharijis in particular, because their groups, the, the labels are religious already. There is a tendency to almost reduce them to their religious identity um but as i said i think this 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 can obscure sometimes at least can obscure our our view of what was actually going on at the time um Very and i mean I, I don't know if this would uh, would be interesting for uh, for people watching this but i um i have a couple of slides which with the for instance with the um the 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 tribal distribution of sure. uh, yeah. oh yeah that'd be amazing you want to share them please so ah uh, I think you need to let me share my screen. Uh, you're now the host. <laughs> Excellent. There we go. Um, where are we here? Um, yeah. So that's not the one, but this here. Can you see this this chart? Oh yes, we can. Oh, and it's in color too. Different. It's than in color too. Art. Exactly. Yeah. So this this is this is what it looked like. Um, um when peter and i compiled it so my my co-author uh peter um made this chart and he's very good with this sort of thing um but basically so this is the tribal affiliation of kharajite leaders um during the umayyad 
period and we broke it down to decade and region. Um, and it's part of the article that you mentioned, Kharaj is in the Maya period. Um, and perhaps just as an illustration of some of the things that we discussed, um, you, you can see here um, that the tribal distribution is very, very obvious in a way. Um, so basically everything that is gray <laughs> um, is, is Rabia um, or is, is a, a certain groups from Rabia. Um, and then uh, the, um, the emerald green is also Rabia, but a different um, group. Um, so this this is one of the things where I think um, people have picked up on this. So as you said, um, you know, Watt mentioned it briefly, Wellhausen mentioned it, mentions it briefly, um, Wickinson um, discussed it, Adam, Ga uh, Adam Gazer mentions it, um, but the the detailed work hasn't been done yet. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and I think something like this, to me at least, certainly suggests that we're not just dealing with um, a, a religious movement um, that was that, that basically had people from all walks of life, even if even if it did to an extent. Um, but this kind of distribution to me suggests that something else is is going on. Very interesting. I'm I'm actually happy that you showed you uh, let us witness this chart or gave us a preview of this chart, especially being that it's in color because in the article it's in black and white. Yes, it's, it's in, in black color. and white. I know. Yeah. You, you really get a because uh, I was trying to figure out like, man, what are these lines and trying to make? <laughs> yeah, sense yeah, 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 yeah. We but, had to we had to come up with the uh, yeah um, yeah a different system to uh, you know display it in black and white exactly. Um, but this is what it actually looked like um, originally. Um, so um, yeah, just as an illustration um, of um, um, of some of the things that we discussed and why I think that as I said, tribal tribal composition may be a good 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 way forward. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and there are, uh, if you don't have any more slides, I am going to, let's see if I can take you, let's see, you're still the host. Or maybe, I think you would have to make me the host again, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've enabled screen sharing for everyone. Okay. Um, I nah, will figure it out later. I guess we'll just work on the uh, conclusion. Um, and so I just have a few questions in the conclusion, uh, yeah. which I kind of started in my last interview, just to kind of uh, wrap things up and to inspire people either to do more research or where they can look for or where they can look yeah. for any of this material and whatnot. Um, what implications does the reconstruction of Qadrajite history have for our understanding of Islam, uh, maybe not Islam as a religion, but at least Islamic history more broadly. Um, well, I mean, it's it's part and parcel of it, um, I should say. Um, I think it depends on on what you mean by Islam. I mean, do you mean Islam the religion? Do you mean Islam the civilization? Do you mean do you mean the history? Do you mean the? Um, I think about all that when I was writing this question down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so in 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 a sense, um, I mean, it it depends really on on uh, on on what you want to focus on. Uh, but of course, um, it 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 all matters um, to all of it. Um, if we understand Kharajism better, then we also understand better um, what lay at the heart of these these revolts, what lay at the heart of of, of the of the conflict. Uh, we understand better, um, you know, what what issues were at stake, and both you know actual material issues, um, but perhaps um, also intellectual issues in the sense of we are dealing with uh, a developing religion in the context of a developing empire um you know you will um you know you may be able to learn more about local communities um about the social fabric of uh is of islamic aid society um so there's 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 really there's a whole list um, um but then then that's that's the um the the, the concrete stuff um there's of course <clears throat> um, more generally, and especially um, comparatively speaking, um, understanding Kharajat revolts better may also help us understand the phenomenon of rebellion better. Um, mm -hmm. So how did people, sorry, how did people express um, opposition, you know, like how did they, how did they negotiate their place, um, you know, within the system? Um, you know what what do we what do we learn about repertoires of of you know conflict management um all these sorts of things um i think can uh, we we can advance by understanding Kharajad revolts better okay and um what advice would you give someone who wants to learn more about the Kharajite history and their intellectual culture 
what advice I would give them. Yeah. Um, buckle down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I would say, you know, Ahlan. Um, what advice would I give them? I guess just not to be deterred by the fact that there's so much that is still that is still you know left to do um you know not to be deterred by by the fact that also um Kharujites do have a very difficult uh reputation and connotation um and um you know that that it sometimes can be a bit daunting to sort of sift through um the um the residue of this reputation um i would encourage them to study Kharijites, um, because it's a very rewarding topic it's very very interesting there's a lot of space um, for a lot of people to do a lot of really interesting and really important work um, and yeah i think that's i mean that's what i would tell them um i mean i would be very very glad uh you know for people to come uh, join the very few of us who do who do work on Kharijites, not just as an aside um, but actually uh Hold on. Mm. And the last question, what are, and you kind of, uh, for anybody who watches this interview, if they're following along closely, you kind of touch on this question a bit uh, in various parts of the interview, but what are some key, key questions or areas of research you think need to be explored further in order to deepen our understanding of the Kharijites? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. No, I think, um, Okay, so I, th I think historiographically speaking, um, a lot of systematic work can and should still be done on how they are presented. Um, as you know, my book, I've uh, focused on um, on the historical tradition, but of course, I mean, the Kharijites are really big in Adab. Um, so I think it'd be wonderful if someone did uh, something similar uh, for the Adab literature, um, for instance. There's, there's um, a bit of scholarship actually on Kharijite poetry um and uh, more engagement with them on uh the on um yeah well the way they are presented in heresiography for instance um but um i think really what we need um we need we need well man and woman power basically so um some of the things that i mentioned um looking looking at the socioeconomic um backgrounds um looking at kharajites um beyond the umayyad period um, studying regional variations. So, for instance, um, I mean, it would be nice if someone just studied Sistan in the early period, full stop. Um, but it would be particularly nice if someone looked at um, sort of Sistani Kharijism, um, the, um, the the tribe and familial connection, um, like a proper proper prosopographical approach. Um, just you know, collecting names, trying to work out who these people are, how they are connected. Um, the overlap between Kharijite revolts and other types of revolts. Some of that we do in the project, um, but that is uh, so much work. Um, you know, it would be wonderful if 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 more people actually joined joined in on this. Um, I think, you know, the Kharijite speeches that have been preserved. Um, like the sermons, um, I think would be would be very interesting to look at, you know, uh, in a, in you know in a sustained manner. Um, there, there's a book that will hopefully come out this year on um, that touches on uh, Kharijite readers of the Quran, so like mm. Kharijite aesthetic uh, ways of reading the Quran, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, so you know, that's that's another very welcome um, edition. Um, but just generally, um, it would it would be great um, to have more research on uh, on quietist Kharijites, or at least on Kharijites that that aren't known for these spectacular, uh, violent um, uh, revolts and activities. Um, so you know, let's let's try not you know not to reduce Kharijism to the Azarika, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, so you know, as you, as you see, I mean, I could I could go on, um, but basically, there's the basically every aspect of Kharijite history, I would say, um, is understudied. I so, 100 percent agree. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, f discovering your work was such a blessing because uh, oh, thank I, you. Ironically, I was uh, very much interested in Ibadism and Kharijism, and then a friend had recommended or said, "Hey, this book just came out uh, came out this year." 
uh, on the topic that you're interested in. And it was your book. Of course, I thought it was a more historical take. Yeah. Uh, and I was no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was in for a surprise that it was more focused on how they were written about in the literature. Yeah. But um, still, it was it was a great addition to uh, my understanding of cottagism, and I still refer back to it um, to this day, even though I bought it. Uh, it came out 2021 in the summer. Um, oh, I'm I glad still, to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Still, it's uh, it's excellent reference work, and I believe anybody interested in the in the topic has to go through your book first, or has to refer to your book um, you. various aspects of whatever they're looking for. So, um, I thank you for all of your hard work. Um, and if uh, thank Roxana you would like to say anything uh, before we wrap up, or if you would like to say anything, Dr. Hagman, before we wrap up, um, all is all is welcome. Uh, no, I just wanted to echo exactly what Taryn said about your book. Um, it was a real game changer for me um, in particular um, in helping to sort of grasp how the Huaraj were written about and um, and how that varied over time and place um, and the sort of literary qualities to that um, was real sort of mind op really, really refreshing and mind opening and um, uh, and something that anybody who I, I recommend that anybody who's interested in this topic start with that book. Um, so uh, that's why we was I was so excited to be able to join this and I've learned so much in the last hour and a half so I wanted to thank you very much. Thank you very much it, it was a great pleasure um, and I'm, it makes me very happy when people not just read the book but also seem to, to, to get something out of it I mean generally speaking as, as you know I mean I, I encourage everyone um, I think to an annoying <laughs> degree uh, to study the Kharajites uh, and I hope I mean Basically, like, I'm very aware that a lot that my that my I mean my work is my reading and my interpretation, and I would be very happy if you know someone read the book and was like, no, I I disagree entirely, and then set out to do the work to prove me wrong. That would be fantastic because then then we'd have the work. Um, so you know uh, I can just uh, you know you know and encourage everyone to um, to get involved with them, um, to get involved with the Kharijites, get involved with uh, their their history. Um, and their legacy it's um it's it's not a um a sort of peripheral phenomenon um it, you know not something i think that that can just be glossed over um but um especially if we get away from from the usual three or four sources um that are consulted when it comes to them i think there's there's a very rich and full uh phenomenon waiting to be studied and i can as i say only encourage people uh to try and take them on god willing and on that note, we're going to conclude this podcast. Thank you, Dr. Hagman, for speaking with us and enlightening us and educating us on the Kadijites, specifically in the Eastern world. But North Africa is another topic in and of itself. Yes. So um, maybe we'll also cover that um, on a later date. But uh, thanks, thanks again.